Welcome everybody to the next episode of the Cannabis Review. I am delighted to be joined on this episode by Dr. Shiksha Gallo, who is a co-founder of a medical director and is a South African pioneer in the field of international medical cannabis research and is a highly accomplished medical professional. How are you keeping today, Shiksha? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Delighted to have you on the show. Uh, you've got a wealth of information that I'm sure the audience is going to love to hear about. Can you maybe give everybody a quick little overview of how you found yourself in the medical cannabis industry? Yeah, it's a quite an interesting story. So I was actually uh, from the uh, vaccine background. I was working at WITS um, Health Consortium and I was involved in the HIV vaccine study and very reputable clinical trials. And then I thought, you know, there must be some other information about, you know, what's about plant medicines instead of pharmaceuticals. And then I was invited to some information on medical cannabis. And then I just fell in love. It was my passion. I saw about the healing. I've learned so much more about the plant and the benefits. And you know what I love about it? You never stop learning. You know, like every day, there's something about the plant that you learn with the different cannabinoid profiles, the APIs, uh, the terpenes, um, helping and treating patients. So since then, I've left, um, you know, the pharmaceutical side from the vaccine industry uh, and dialed straight into the clinical trials with regards to medical cannabis and other natural plants as well. Okay, amazing. Yeah, I was going through your resume. <laughs> it was pretty much, I was like, right, even this interview, I'm not going to be able to mention every single thing that you've been a part <laughs> of because it seemed very, uh, very accomplished. So what I'm going to do is break it into two, two topics. The first topic I want to talk about was patient access in South Africa. Now, we know medical cannabis access programs worldwide start off uh, with splutters very few countries have been able to implement one successfully can you maybe tell the audience of what the patient access looks like in south africa who prescribes it where they obtain the uh, the, the products from and uh, yeah thank you okay awesome so there's two parts i'll start with the first part uh, so the south african government actually decriminalized medical cannabis so what that means is they allowed private use so patients are allowed to grow it into the in their own yards in a private space and make their own medicines or oils but they're not allowed to sell it i think they allowed about 1.2 kgs per household um so 600 grams per person i think so that is what you know the first access that happened in about 2018 then the medical cannabis uh, was introduced and it was legislated uh, as a schedule six for uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, your THC, and then your CBD is a schedule four, the cannabidiol. So the access right now uh, currently is the, uh, the only way we can access it for patients is a section 21. What that means, Ian, is there's a, basically a, a, the, a patient has to go to a doctor and the doctor will have to apply for a section 21, which means it's unregistered medicine. So once that application goes through, you will have to make a motivation. Why are you prescribing this for the patients? Um, you know, I'll give you some examples. If the patient has, you know, uh, palliative care and the, the, the morphine or opioids are not working, then you can say this is the reason why. It goes through SAPRA, which stands for South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. They would then approve it, and then that patient will then get that medicine dispensed. So it is quite a lot of work for the doctor to do because it's a lot of paperwork. Um, so, and that is how the process is. So the access is very limited, but there are going to be um, medicines that are going to be rolled out very soon. I have actually put in dossiers three years ago for the first medical cannabis um, medicines to be um, you know, registered in South Africa. We're quite far down the line with SAPRA with the dossiers. What will happen then? And um, oh, and once that um, medicine gets uh, registered, then any doctor then can then prescribe these medicines. It doesn't have to go under the Section 21 process, which is very time consuming. So, yeah, as, a, as it stands, uh, access limited from a doctor perspective to a patient, but they are allowed to grow it uh, and have access to it privately. Okay, very interesting. And are products like Epidiolex available for patients in South Africa or is their own uh, brand version of nothing, that? No, nothing as yet. Epidiolex is not even uh, yeah, not, not available in South Africa as yet. So there isn't actually any, uh, the ones that we're currently using on a Section 21 are from Canada, uh, things like your, uh, your Hexo or your TGOD. Uh, so those are the ones that are currently the Section 21. What's also happening is some of the separate license facilities are also registering their products be it the flower because uh, they have licenses under the section 21 so we can also have access with the south african based uh, medicine but that's for the flower for the oils uh, we're still working on how we're going to get those dossiers submitted that is why the clinical trials are key because what separate requires is you have to prove data on the medicines that you want to actually register you know so when you're submitting a dossier for registration you have to actually show that 
uh, this is the clinical data that is safe for the patient, and this is what we are looking at, and this is what we have treated the patients with. Very interesting. And we're in the middle of uh, trying to over to get our medical cannabis access program in Ireland here expanded. It's very, very limited at the moment. What's the one thing that you think is the biggest failing for most medical cannabis access programs worldwide? What's the biggest hurdle that everybody needs to get over? Look, the biggest hurdle is the stigma. Um, you know, the stigma attached is still very huge. A lot of people are indoctrinated by the old school pharmaceutical type practices. And what people don't understand, you can actually use both. You don't have to have this one or that one. You can actually use cannabis and eventually wean patients off the pharmaceutical meds to the most safe, effective medicine. So the stigma attached for me is really huge. The lack of knowledge by medical professionals, especially in South Africa, is really huge. The resistance to actually change to, to uh, you know, to, to, to have patients uh, use medical cannabis that for me is huge i see it here in oncology we deal with a lot of uh, cancer patients normally palliative care and the doctors most of the doctors oncologists are dead against cannabis you know and i don't understand why and what i what i realize is that it's the lack of knowledge or education and i feel once we can educate the medical professionals and say this is the benefits this is the endocannabinoid system this is how the cannabinoids work this is all science it's not just snake oil, then I think they will be more, you know, um, receptive to actually having their patients on it. Okay. Do you think biosynthesis is the future of cannabinoid medicines? Or do you think there'll always be a place for extracted cannabinoids from flour? It seems that biosynthesis has got to be much more uh, regulated, much more pure, a much more superior price point. And there seems to be a lot of uh, positives that move in that direction. And it's something that you might get clinical boards and let's say old school indoctrinated doctors, as you said, they'll be more mm. palatable to, to uh, prescribe something that's already capsule and, and in pill form as opposed to trying to learn about blends and formulations of cannabinoids and terpenes. No, 100%. I think that is the way to go. That is why that medicine, you know, I, I think there's a place for both. Um, but in our context, in our country, I feel with the doctors, what will make it easier for them if you have a set of formula, that is why the dossiers that I brought in, it's a two to one ratio, for example, uh, with the CBD 20 milligram with the THC uh, 10 milligram, the others are one to one ratio. So that's already in that format where we just then teach the doctors how to dose it. So it's already in a you know a bioavailable for, format. There's also sprays now, you know, with the tincture. So they, I feel definitely there's, you know, there is place for both. But the doctors, you also want to make their lives easier. You want to say, here's a product, like similar to how you have your opioids. This is the recommended uh, dosage. This is how we would recommend you prescribe. But the other problem that we have, Owen, that I've actually noticed with patients and the other doctors I'm working with, is cannabis is different because it's an individualized treatment plan. So, you know, you can have the same disease as somebody else, but your dose may be a little bit different from the other dose. That is why we always say, you know, with dosing, we always start uh, low, go slow until we build up those cannabinoids. So that's the thing. Once we teach the medical professionals, I mean, I've trained over... Um, over 100 medical professionals at one of the events, but it was a very short training. And, you know, they just opened up their minds to so much more. But I agree with you that you need to give them something. Don't expect them to mix and formulate and teach them about the terpenes. Just say, here's the formulation. This is how we suggest you dose. And that will definitely work, be it in capsules or oils or sprays. Very good. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I'm going to move on to the last topic now, and it's basically the first medical cannabis study that's happening in South Africa. Now, you're one of the lead investigators in that. Can you tell us basically how far you are along in this study? What is the main objective that you're looking to get out of the study and the duration that you hope it'll take? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so it's a very interesting study. What we're actually looking at is how we can actually replace um, opioids using a medical cannabis for chronic uh, pain management. Uh, so we, we had to renew the study for another year. year. Initially, we had a you know, few issues with regards to uh, recruitment of patients and all of that, a lot of uh, teething issues. Uh, look, it was the first study. So we've learned from them. So we renewed uh, the study um, and we're looking to recruit uh, uh, patients. It was a thousand sample size. So we're looking to see how many we actually do get and what type of evidence that we get. So yeah, we're looking to see um, how do the patients actually respond to these um, 
the, the various formulations that the doctors will prescribe can we actually get them off the opioids you know uh, with the you know with can cannabinoids it's you know the mechanism of analgesia is opioid sparing effect and we do know that cannabinoids work synergistically with opioids and pain relief so we're looking at the more association with the opiate sparing effect looking at how cannabis can actually help prevent tolerance to and withdraw from the opiates and also looking at how we can rekindle the opiate analgesia after prior dosage has worn off and we're going to then document all of that besides just uh, looking at that we're also going to be looking at the quality of life of those patients um what that means has the quality of life improved um you know opposite changing from the cannabinoids to the cannabis um uh, with the pain management we're going to use the brief pain inventory uh you know which is the world health organization to, to, to look at the pain before and after while they were on the opioids and while we we're weaning them off and the pilot study results really looked good uh, because we had about 98 percent of the patients that had pain relief um, from the medical uh, cannabis, we were able to wean all of those patients off the opioids. With some patients, it took much longer. With some patients, it was much easier. Um, with the cancer patients, it also took much longer as well. So it will also depend on the, the specific diagnosis on that patient. So although we're working with chronic pain, we're going to have patients with various ailments, various diagnoses from be it um, uh, cancer oncology patients or be it patients with just migraines or patients with autoimmune disease like your multiple sclerosis fibromyalgia so you know we still also you know learning a lot but the, the pilot study was showed great results so we're really excited to see you know what will be the outcome can we actually get the patients weaned off the opioids can cannabinoids actually be a replacement for opioids is it too mild is it too strong what will be the exact dosages that we will need for patients because patients will differ as i mentioned earlier individualized treatment and lastly does cannabis actually help to improve the quality of life of those patients because we know with opioids you know the quality of life of the patients is not really good you know the effect it has on the organs the liver and all of that besides the toxicity you know the overdose and the um uh, is also a great concern and also the, the opioid uh, deaths or mortality rates that we've been having so we're going to get a lot of data out of it so we're really excited to see uh, you know where where we can we're going to head we're going to run it for a year so we're expecting to publish and finish everything within a year Okay, incredible. I look forward to seeing the results of that because I don't think there's a country in the world that doesn't, that somebody doesn't know somebody who's been addicted to opioids at some stage, whether it started off as back pain or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So even if you can turn those into blends with cannabinoids and blend the both of them together so it's not as addictive would be the, the primary objective for sure. Tell me this, of all the places around the world, what country or what state or what city implemented the best medical cannabis access program that you know of? Look, uh, I'm working very closely with Canada. You know, Canada has been many years ahead. I have partners there as well who have helped us as well here in South Africa with a lot of things. I'm working uh, with a lot of clinics in Canada as well. So um, I really see Canada, you know, with the way that they're going with the medical way forward. Um, I think it's, it's, it allows access to patients. It's still managed. Everything is still controlled according to your standards. So I think it was it's, they, they actually did really well. I'm also part of the Society of Cannabis Clinicians. I'm one of the board of directors in the US and the UK. So with the United States, also, you know, with the clinicians I'm working with, they're really, you know, really, really forward thinking, understand it, really good with the patients. The access, unfortunately, it depends on the different states and the legislation across states. So that is the one issue with the US. Um, but for me, I think Canada is still really, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm working very closely with the Canadians. But um, I've been to Germany now recently for ICBC, the International Cannabis Business Conference in, myself, um, yeah. in Berlin. Yeah, so that was also awesome. I've met a lot of um, interesting people as well. And I see Germany's trying you know, to get the medical moving forward and also trying to see how they're going to work with the recreational. But there's still a lot of stumbling blocks and things they're looking at. And then I just want to mention one more country I'm working with as well is Thailand. I mean, Thailand's just opened up now. Um, you know, they they obviously trying to find their feet, but I think they're allowing a lot more access with regards to patients and all of that. So it's interesting to watch and see, you know, Netherlands, Switzerland also, you know, coming into play um, to see what, you know, what uh, the medical side as well. Uh, but I think Canada, for me, because I've been working closely with the doctors and the clinics seem to be, you know, have a lot of patients have access there. There's not too many restrictions. 
Yeah, for a lot of a lot of stick that the Canadian uh, industry takes, I think they've gotten a lot of things better than most other territories that have legalized. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, Shiksha. I could talk to you all day. I think you've got a wealth of information. <laughs> awesome. um, we're at our time. So thank you very much for again. Hopefully we can touch base when you've come towards the end of your study and uh, we'd be happy to publish it up here in Europe for you. Um, yeah, it's yeah. been absolutely great chatting to you. Awesome. Thank you so much and all the best. Bye. Have a great day. Until the next episode. Oh,